Good morning, everybody, and welcome on this uh, beautiful March morning here in Florida. And I am Lily Browning. We're here to bring you Pulling in the Pollinators. And I invite my special guest. I invited Frank Galdo from Pasco County. He's the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator in Pasco County. Oh, no, Frank is muted. <laughs> let's, let's unmute him. I want him to talk and I, uh, there we go. You should be asked to unmute. You see that? Well, let's see. You know what we'll do? We'll make you a co-host. I forgot to do that. <laughs> there we go. There we go. There's Frank. Yay. All right. <laughs> Welcome, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. And um, I asked him to join me because I know this is a particular um, you know, love of, of Frank's. He loves all the little wildflowers and the pollinators and all the little insects and things. And he's out there probably more than I am, you know, um, taking pictures of them and getting really excited about them. So I asked him to join me today. Um, he's going to discuss kind of like design and how you can bring in pollinators. pollinators. And then I am going to um, show you pretty pictures of a few, like a starter pack that you can start with. All right, Frank, why don't you go ahead and get started and um, I'll uh, monitor the chat for you and you can start right. screen sharing. Thank you. And by the much. way, there's a little bug by your ear, actually a massively huge bug by your ear, just so you know. <laughs> All right. So, uh, do I have the correct screen up? Well, yes, I see it now. Okay. All right. Perfect. Well, today we're going to talk about pulling in the pollinators. And like Lily mentioned, it is a topic that I really uh, enjoy talking about. I enjoy photographing. I enjoy sharing it all with you guys. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm uh, glad Lily invited me to take part in this. Um, she's constantly putting on awesome programs and I'm catching them whenever I can. And uh, yeah, happy to be taking part in one. Um, so I am program coordinator of Florida Friendly Landscaping in Pasco County, uh, Lily's counterpart down here, uh, just to the south of Hernando. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna dive right into it. And everyone see the screen that he's sharing? Just put in the chat if you can't. All right. I see it kind of in the background. What's that? Um, I see mine is acting strange today. So I see it kind of in the background. So okay. I'm just making sure that everybody can see it. Okay, but the presentation itself is coming up and you're not seeing the notes screen or anything like that. Correct. Perfect. All right. Well, um, you know, if you're joining us today, maybe your landscape looks something a little bit like this, and you've been checking off the Florida Friendly uh, Landscaping Principles, and, you know, you got right plant, right place, fertilize appropriately, doing all that stuff, but it still feels kind of like something is missing. So today we're going to kind of cover the elements of attracting wildlife, and specifically, talking about pollinators, uh, because there's this incredible diversity that we can support right here in our own landscapes and our own communities. And it really is a case of if you build it, they will come. So before we really get into the design aspects and all that kind of stuff, um, the term pollinator itself can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so I want to learn a little bit about you guys that are tuned in today. Uh, and what kind of pollinators you're really interested in uh, bringing into your landscape. Uh, so just to kind of give you some examples, and you can go ahead and start typing things into the chat. If you've got some pollinators that you're really uh, interested in drawing in, you know, are you into hummingbirds? Maybe some of Florida's fascinating native bees. Uh, we've got some incredible diversity here. Yep, we already have one answer from Kat that um, native bees. Very cool. Um, so maybe you're more into butterflies and moths. Uh, a lot of folks love those fluttering around in the garden. 
And another answer is all the insects. All the insects, mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, yeah. So, you know, some folks are really into the honeybees. Maybe they want to have their own little honey production going on. Austin wants to um, see the pretty butterflies. He's interested in all right. the prettiness. Hardly anybody ever says this one, but I am actually really fascinated more and more every day by wasps. Um, there is such a crazy diversity of beneficial wasps, uh, most of them solitary and docile, uh, and a lot of them beneficial in a dozen different ways to your garden. Uh, so believe it or not, yeah, wasps are some pretty cool pollinators too. Actually, we have um, one of our participants um, is fascinated by every wasp that's not a paper wasp. <laughs> I'm with you there. <laughs> I feel you. Paper wasps kind of go and give the whole wasp category a bad name. And it's it's unfortunate. They they really are the poster child for wasps, them and like yellow jackets and things like that. Um, but all the rest of the, the wasp uh, group of insects is just well worth exploring and appreciating. Uh, another one that doesn't get nearly enough attention, flies. Uh, there's actually quite a few flies. They're kind of minor pollinators, but a lot of them have secondary beneficial roles in the garden. Uh, so they're not as efficient and effective as pollinators as bees, because they don't have such hairy bodies and legs and stuff. Um, but flies can be cool in their own right. So I don't know if anybody's into them, but something to keep in mind. Uh, even beetles. Not those beetles. Not those the beetles. Not the Abbey Road beetles. beetles. Yeah, we got all sorts of different things that can be doing some pollination. And this is kind of just getting into the main groups. There's even other things like bats and things like that. So yeah, it sounds like we've got uh, you know an interesting collection. We got folks into the bees, the butterflies, all the bugs. Um, I want to take a quick step back and and talk about something that really sparked my mind on all of this. And it takes us back about a year ago, almost exactly. Um, so here I was volunteering as a poll deputy for a local voting precinct. And I was staring at this landscape all day long outside this community's clubhouse. And I'm just sitting there. And in the entire day that I was there, I probably only noticed one insect that really like stuck out in my mind. And it blew my mind because it was this lone paper wasp and it was just going bush to bush. And it was like looking like it was just frantically searching for food, for something to eat. And it was actually pretty sad. And it got me thinking a lot because a lot of the landscapes that I tend to visit as a Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator, um, they kind of have that same sort of feeling going on. Even if they're pretty healthy and they're checking off a lot of the FFL boxes, a lot of landscapes wind up feeling just sort of sterile and quiet and lifeless. And in comparison, my landscape is pretty much always an absolute flurry of activity. So there's big bees and little bees and green bees and caterpillars and hummingbirds and butterflies. And the difference was just really, really striking that day as I was sitting there and just, you know, having a lot of time to stare at a landscape and think. And so it, it really got me thinking, what is it that's going on in my yard that's different? And, and that's kind of the core of what I'm gonna get into today of how can you create a landscape that just draws in all of these different pollinators? It's really not too difficult once you kind of get the fundamentals. So one of the big ones, and this is probably the one that's most obvious to a lot of folks, uh, food and habitat. And you know, when we talk about food for pollinators, obviously your mind immediately goes to flowers uh, for pollen and nectar and things like that. And then maybe for butterflies and things, you start thinking about the host plants and all that. But food and habitat kind of goes beyond just the flowers aspect and the host plants. Uh, it includes things like the shelter and the habitat and overwintering protection and things like that. So a lot of this is gonna be a little bit dependent on which species you might be trying to draw in 
or if you're trying to really attract a mixture. So for instance, what's gonna bring in hummingbirds is gonna be a little bit different than what's gonna bring in bees or wasps and things like that. So maybe you only really want the hummingbirds and you're really allergic to bees and wasps. You can do a little bit more targeting things with these red tube shaped flowers that are abundant in spring and summer and things like that. Um, now, if you wanna attract the whole diversity, you're probably gonna want a diversity of flower shapes and bloom times and things like that. Um, so things like bees and wasps tend to be a little bit more favoring of things with shallow uh, open discs or narrow um, skinny tubes that aren't very long, like the, uh, the basil and the salvias and things like that, um, because they don't really have the, the tongue, the structure to get inside those long tube shaped flowers. Um, so, When it comes to things like butterflies, again, you're gonna to wanna to ensure that they've got their flowers for nectar and pollen and things like that. Also though, um, butterflies have a complex life cycle and most of them depend on very specific plants when they're young. So some of you guys may already be familiar with this, but for those who don't know, most butterflies uh, and moths have very specific plants that they can eat as caterpillars to get them through that stage in life. And we call those host plants. And to really support these guys, you wanna have both the nectar plants and host plants within a pretty close proximity so that the, the full life cycle can happen without having to travel a really long way. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've gotta have all of them right there in your yard. You know, if your neighbors or your, your local pond have that sort of thing, uh, you can, actually create really good habitat without having to make all of it happen right there in your uh, specific yard. All right. And in fact, UF has a really cool document that uh, I don't hear talked about nearly enough. It's called community butterfly scaping. It's this concept that you can sort of maximize the pollinator habitat if you look at it on a community wide scale. So there are things that are too large to fit in most single family residential yards uh, in terms of some of the large trees or the things that want to grow along the wetland edge and things like that. You can expand the amount of habitat you can create if you kind of capitalize on providing what's missing and looking what's already there or looking at the bigger picture. Um, so really cool document, I encourage you to explore it just kind of concept to keep in mind. So, you know, things like these community ponds, we've got them all over the place. These can absolutely be part of a wider habitat, incorporating trees and aquatic and semi-aquatic plants and things like that. Um, so kind of encourage you to think big picture. Think about what's already there, what opportunities you have, maybe kind of engage the community and uh, think outside the box. Now, when people start butterfly gardening or pollinator gardening, um, one of the things that's kind of interesting is often people get surprised by how much predator pressure there is from birds and wasps and lizards and things like that, especially on the caterpillar phase. And so when we talk about uh, providing habitat and providing the host plants and things like that, it's important to consider the need for some shelter and camouflage and protection. Often what you wind up seeing is just host plants kind of sticking out there and just having all these caterpillars just kind of vulnerable and uh, you know a real obvious easy site for picking off from birds and caterpillars and all, or birds and lizards and things. One way that you can get around this without having to go to the trouble of building enclosures and all that kind of stuff is try to incorporate some of your host plants actually in amongst ornamental grasses and shrubs, even dry stems and flower stalks. Um, they don't even have to be the dry stems and flower stalks that are growing there. Uh, I literally have been uh, recently cutting back all the stems from my uh, liatris and goldenrod and various fall bloomers uh, where I left those stems over winter. And now I'm cutting them back and tucking them in corners of the yard where I've got my milkweed and things like that. You can just poke them in the ground or lay them down as brush piles. 
and you can actually create safe vertical structure that gives them a little bit of shelter so they're not having to wander all over the place uh, and be exposed crawling up the wall um, looking for a safe place to make a chrysalis. Um, so ornamental grasses, shrubs, anything that you've got that you can have close by. Um, you know, I kind of look at it as the have your cake and eat it too. You can cut your stems, keep them too. Don't toss them, put them to good use. Um, even some of our uh, solitary bees and wasps will actually use some of those same hollow stems, create cozy little nests. They'll plug them up with a little bit of mud or leaves and things like that. Uh, so a lot of benefit from keeping a little bit of that stuff around. You know, we talk about recycle yard waste. A lot of times people immediately think of composting, but there's a lot of ways we can recycle yard waste to make it sort of naturally part of the ecosystem. So a lot of things uh, ordinarily would be just falling to the ground and collecting and being used in different ways. We can mimic that, but in a way that both maintains a neat habitat uh, where, you know, we want our landscape to look neat for the neighbors and all that, um, but we're also providing the shelter that they need. So have your cake, eat it too. Cut your stems, keep them too. So kind of brings up an interesting bigger point. Uh, when we think about pollinator gardens, uh, again, a lot of times the first immediate thought is wildflowers. Everybody starts thinking about the pretty wildflowers, um, you know, fast blooming plants, they reseed a lot, all that kind of stuff. When it really comes to good habitat value, you can't really overstate the importance of including trees and vines and shrubs and grasses if you've got the space. So even some dried stems tucked around, like I mentioned, can give some vertical structure and things like that. Uh, but if you've got the space to add some flowering trees and shrubs, uh, these can provide some fantastic shelter and also extraordinarily good nectar sources at their peak bloom times. So definitely something to keep in mind. A um, couple of the ones that I've got here on screen that bloom throughout different points of the year. You've got the Walters viburnum up there in the top left corner, Simpson stopper there on the bottom left, you have firebush in the bottom center, some yopon holly on the bottom right, and then up in the top you got the coral honeysuckle, which is a, a climbing vine. And something that's really important to keep in mind when it comes to designing your landscape and choosing your plants, you know, we always want to be going first and foremost with right plant, right place. You want to pick your plants based on the growing conditions that you've got. And there's some great guides out there that can help you narrow down which plants are gonna be the right plant for the size space you have and things like that. But another thing you wanna keep in mind if you're trying to attract pollinators is that very few plants will bloom nonstop throughout the year and still provide really good high quality nectar and pollen resources. So often the plants that are gonna be able to bloom just continuously are doing it because they're kind of producing cheap flowers. There's not a lot of energy going into those in terms of the pollen and nectar. On the other hand, some of the best plants are actually those that have a distinct sort of seasonality to them where they save up the resources throughout the year and they're gonna put it all out there in a big show. And a lot of our native pollinators have actually adapted around these cycles. And so if you can incorporate plants that aren't gonna necessarily bloom continuously any single one of them, but will provide a continuous cycle throughout the year where there's gonna be abundant flowers of different shapes and sizes that are going off at any given time. And given that selection, so that you can have some that the bees are gonna be into, some that the flies are gonna be into. You're gonna have your big open, your small tubes. Try to aim for as much diversity and continuity throughout the year like that. And you're gonna have a really good uh, diversity of pollinators following those circles around. Particularly pay attention to spring, summer, and fall, because that's when the pollinators here in central Florida are most active. So a lot of them kind of take a little break during winter. You'll still have a little bit of activity, but, uh, but yeah. 
Now, quick pro tip here when it comes to pollinators and especially things that bloom seasonally, you want to be paying attention to the timing of your pruning. And the reason is, especially uh, some of these plants like Simpson Stopper, for instance, which is just about to start blooming right now. Simpson Stopper blooms on the tips of new springtime growth. Now, when they flush out all this new springtime growth, one of the immediate responses, especially in a lot of commercially lands, uh, managed landscapes, is to go out there and start pruning these things and hedging them and making sure that they stay nice little tight meatballs. And if you do that, you're going to prune off all the flowers for the year, at which point, you know, you lose the pollinator benefit and then you lose the other wild be wildlife benefits from the fruits that would follow. So know a little bit about the, the timing of your plants so that you can prune at the right time and then lay back and let it do its thing at the right time. So with Simpson Stopper, if you really want to shape it up you know, earlier in the year or later in the year, not right now. Um, and each plant's going to have different cycles like that. So kind of, if you're not sure, it's a great thing to ask your local master gardeners, Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, uh, your local Native Plant Society, things like that. We're all going to be able to give you the inside scoop on what you should do with that particular plant get the most bang for the buck. All right, so kind of ran through a lot of things about the food and habitat and shelter, uh, giving you the crash course kind of super concise version. Next thing I'm going to dive into is the importance of recognizing good bugs and acceptable damage. And the reason that I bring this up when it comes to pollinator gardening, well, there's a couple of things. For one thing, some pollinators are actually going to do some minor damage in the garden. And it's kind of, it goes with the territory. It's par for the course. So you want to be careful not to panic the moment you see some damage on your plants. Um, because, you know, caterpillars eat the leaves of their host plants. And also, these semicircle cutouts on uh, some of the bean plants that were in the community garden last year. In the chat, Toss in your guess if you think you know what you've got here. And then I'll, I'll tell you here in a second. Um, Kat says leaf cutter bees. Bingo. So awesome. Good job, Kat. Uh, so by the shape of those perfect little semicircle cutouts uh, and the fact there's such clean margins and everything, I immediately knew we had some resident leafcutter bees gathering their uh, little leaf cutouts to line their nest. And so the plants are going to be fine. Uh, leafcutters are fascinating pollinators. And somehow, I don't exactly know how, I'd love to learn a little bit more about this, but I never ever see the cuts that they make ever have any kind of disease transmission or anything like that. It's like they sterilize and cauterize the thing as they go or something. I, I don't exactly understand it, but um, yeah. Damage is largely cosmetic. It's pretty brief, the window of time that they actually do this. And uh, here's actually a little slow-mo video that I captured of a leafcutter bee flying into the uh, drainage hole in a pot of, I think it was lemongrass I was growing at that time. But they will just basically create like a little waterproof tube wherever it is that they're making their nest and lay their eggs in there, line it up. And uh, yeah, they'll finish it up. Plant isn't much worse for the wear. So another really fascinating example. And uh, this one, it's like National Geographic or a David Attenborough special or something when I see stuff like this. I started to notice some of the flowers in my garden, particularly some of the aster family flowers, uh, looking really ragged. And all of a sudden it was like, you know, half the petals were missing and it was just really strange. And so I started looking closely and I actually found these camouflaged loopers, which are the caterpillar of a wavy lined emerald moth. And the reason they're called cap, uh, camouflaged loopers is that they will literally, as they go and feed on a flower, they'll cut 
the petals from the flower they eat and attach them to the back with little strands of silk. And so they'll actually wear the camouflage of the flower they're feeding on. And if they move to a different kind of flower, they'll actually change out the whole camouflage. So, um, you know, a little bit of damage for something like that is totally acceptable in my book. Um, but, you know, it's something where sometimes you start to have to look really closely to see what's going on. All right. So related to that, that's going to lead me to the next key step here, which is that if you're supporting pollinators, uh, you're going to inherently want to be also minimizing the pesticide use in your garden and practicing what we call integrated pest management, which basically means you want to try to keep your plants as healthy as possible, right plant, right place, correct watering, correct fertilizing, all that sort of stuff. And then if they do start to get problems, you want to identify them correctly and early. So doing some regular scouting, keeping an eye on stuff so it doesn't get so out of hand that you have to pull out the big guns. And then use targeted least toxic methods of control if needed. So don't just automatically reach for the broad spectrum, kill everything kind of pesticides. If there's something much more targeted that you can use uh, in its place. And again, this is one of those things where you can contact your extension, uh, you can contact your FFL program, and we're gonna be able to help you make those determinations and figure out what you need to do. You know, I said use those pest control methods if needed, because often if somebody sends me a picture or I take a look at something going on, by the time you actually notice there's a problem with something like aphids, if you look really closely, there's actually already a full pest patrol crew of larval ladybugs and lace wings and hoverflies and parasitoid wasps and all sorts of things, uh, especially if you've kind of been making the effort to cultivate a healthy population of bugs and critters in your yard. So a lot of times this stuff just sort of balances itself out. And by the time you notice something, you know, in this case, we've already got a hoverfly larva chowing down on aphids. And those tan papery ones are actually what are called aphid mummies, which are parasitoid wasps that laid their eggs inside the aphid. These are super, super tiny wasps. So not even really something you're ever going to see themselves, but you'll see these paper shells of mummy aphids um, letting you know that everything's doing good under control. Now, you don't have to just kind of take my word for that. UF has actually recently been doing some really awesome research looking at pollinators, pollinator habitat, beneficial insects. Specifically, they're taking a place that ordinarily you don't associate with pollinators and good bugs, golf courses. So in the middle of a golf course in an out of play area, they've been installing pollinator habitat. And it turns out that the more diverse the plantings that they put in there, and the more year round they make their supply of nectar and pollen and refuge, all the things I was just mentioning, not only are you attracting a greater diversity of pollinators, um, you're also actually providing pest control in the surrounding area, uh, just from those awesome bugs that you're able to attract. Um, so, you know, UF is showing this in probably the least likely of places. And if you can do it on a golf course, you can really do this just about anywhere. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of key things that um, I'm gonna share as a couple of last tips here. And one is kind of an interesting one that's coming out more and more in the last few years. Many native pollinators, um, especially some of the bees and wasps, have a portion of their life cycle that's actually underground. And so we talk a lot in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program of the importance of mulch and things like that. Nice thick layer of mulch, insulate the soil. In the case of attracting and supporting pollinators, it can actually be beneficial to locate areas in your landscape that maybe don't need such a thick layer of mulch and definitely don't want any synthetic weed barriers and things like that. And so if you can find places that aren't necessarily prone to erosion and maybe have enough canopy over top that 
the weeds aren't so much of an issue. Uh, try to leave a little bit of area, just thinly mulched, a, li a little layer of leaves. And that's actually gonna help these guys be able to burrow in, get in there, make their nests over winter and have a place uh, ideally out of the way where uh, you know their little burrows aren't gonna be bothersome or uh, causing an eyesore. And another thing, you know, this is where it really gets interesting to me is that when a lot of native pollinators actually spend time underground, when you start to realize that, all of a sudden it makes this seem even more foreign to the idea of supporting our pollinators and things like that. So routine broad spectrum pesticide applications to the entire landscape. Um, you know, think about what that's doing to your next generation of pollinators that are sitting there and overwintering underground. And, uh, you know, some of them are actually helping to control the grubs and things like that, if you let them. So, you know, again, particularly in winter, try to lay back on some of those routine applications. You know, if there's not a problem, don't treat a problem that doesn't exist. So, final tip. Be prepared for weeds. Anytime you're gonna uh, start modifying your landscape and adding new plants and stirring up the soil, there will be weeds waiting to foil your plants. Uh, the, the seed bank is deep and it lasts a long time. And so you wanna be prepared for weeds and proactively take steps to minimize issues and get them early and often because nothing undoes landscaping efforts and takes the wind out of your sails like having the whole thing taken over by weeds. Uh, I know Lily's done some programs on it. Uh, a year ago or so, uh, Chris Marble from UF actually had a great program focusing entirely on natural weed control in the home landscape. Uh, I would encourage you to check out the recording from that. It's still available online. Um, but absolutely, you know, it, it's not directly tied to attracting pollinators, but it's... Um, it's applicable because if you start attracting pollinators, uh, weed control is gonna come into play one way or another. All right, uh, I've got a ton of useful pollinator links. I compiled them here. We can send them out to everybody so you don't have to try to write them down. Um, but there's some really great stuff from UF and a couple different organizations uh, attracting native bees to your Florida landscape, uh, recent publication, the community butterfly scaping, all sorts of stuff like that. So um, yeah. With that, I believe that's about what I had in terms of the design. Obviously, you can go more into detail uh, on a lot of different elements of this, and I'm happy to kind of follow up with more folks uh, with specific questions and stuff, but I wanted to make sure we could get into uh, some of the plants that you have and some of the questions, and so yeah. Thank you very so, much, Frank. Uh, that was fascinating, especially that um little lopper that disguises itself. I mean, I've never heard of that. That was, that's incredible. Puts on oh, yeah. the flower. <laughs> it's, it's, that's really neat. We do have some questions for you. Um, Austin has asked, I believe what he's asking is um, if we have the plants, but yet nobody else around us does, you know, what do these pollinators do then if they have specific you know, I guess some are very host specific or so, and if they can't find the same plants nearby, you know, that's, I guess, what he's asking. Right. Our neighbors so, don't participate with us. So, so if you're kind of sitting out there alone island for the pollinators, um, a couple things come to mind. One, I think when you're the only game in town, you have to kind of also expect that you're gonna be attracting the attention of all the various predators, all the birds, the lizards, you know, everything is gonna be drawn in. Uh, and sometimes people get discouraged by that, especially if they're really hoping that what they're gonna do is help save the monarchs or, you know, help sustain uh, a population of butterflies in their yard, because you're gonna keep seeing your caterpillars getting picked off. And, there's a couple different ways people go about it. Sometimes people will take the approach of, I really want to see these butterflies go through their whole life cycle. And so they'll kind of do the enclosure thing. 
And I would say, you know, as an occasional thing, that's all right. But overall, I, I take the bigger picture approach that if they're getting picked off and you're bringing in all these lizards and wasps and things like that, you're creating a larger habitat. So there's a bigger picture when we draw in pollinators that you can't really separate it out from this larger web of wildlife that is also hungry and looking for food and shelter and all those different things. And so I think trying to maximize the bang for the buck of the space that you have to work with and figure out you know, what, what can you do best in the space you have. So look at the conditions you have, the space you have, and try to, try to provide some of that year-round benefit. And then try to kind of appreciate the big picture side of it. Make it look as good as you can so that maybe your neighbors can be encouraged like, hey, that looks really good. I want to do that too. What is that plant? Um, you know, draw them in by, by example. If your yard's got all the butterflies flying around, the flowers are looking, you know, off the hook, and you got really nice looking well-pruned bushes in the front, and, uh, you know, all your squash are just getting pollinated like crazy, and you're giving them away to the neighbors or whatever, um, you know, that's going to set a good example. I also, um, this kind of brings up um, what I'm going to get into as well is um, I think this is where our weeds take over. The things that we consider weeds, they're going to be growing anywhere, despite people's best efforts, especially in some of the quote, quote, unimproved areas. So, you know, there's always the native wildflowers, the native quote, quote, weeds that will be there <laughs> for these pollinators as well. So. Yeah, so you, you can kind of look at that two ways. Um, you know, one is they're going to pop up, they're going to be helping you do your job. Uh, another is if it's pretty abundant in the nearby areas, maybe you can, you know, not dedicate your little amount of space to something that's already growing, you know, on all the roadsides in the, in the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. if you've got a, a lot of flea bane and Biden's alba popping up all over the neighborhood, you know, maybe that's not the plant to also allow to volunteer in uh, your whole yard because there's already acres of it all around you. Uh, so, you know, it's that idea of maximize the benefit. If, if there's already something in abundance, you know, let's say all your neighbors have a plumbago and it was just kind of one of the foundation plants really commonly planted in your neighborhood, you know, maybe even if it's happy looking, don't necessarily go for another plumbago, kind of go outside the box and see what you can do to expand the palette. Um, but if you're in a, a place where, like you mentioned, there's sterile landscapes where nothing is happening, um, somewhere around you, you know, maybe just outside the walls of your gated community or something, you know, on the roadsides or wherever, there, there's some plants for them that they'll find. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, let's see what else we have. Um, Nikki wants to know if you have a sample garden plan of plants to put together to achieve year long benefits to the pollinators. So, um, she's starting with a blank slate. Nice. Yeah. So actually in the, um, the plants for native bees link, uh, that I mentioned up there a minute ago. Um, that one actually does have a sample garden design. It's kind of like a corner garden and they designed it with some larger shrubs in the background and lower plants in the center, different bloom times, different colors, different shape blooms and things like that. Um, now, obviously those designs are gonna change depending on your site conditions and where you're located in the state and all those different things, but it can kind of give you a good sense for the structure and the way that you might wanna think of it. You know, some shrubs, some grasses, different things. Um, and I think some of the Florida Wildflower Foundation and I'm gonna have that link. if I'm not mistaken, actually have bloom times included and kind of give you uh, some windows when the peak blooming for different species are. Um, 
but yeah, and I'm going to have their link at the end of my presentation, so you'll be able nice, to find. Nice. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a, a few different links out there. Um, I believe in some of the stuff that I had on my screen and in one of my blog posts called creating a pollinator paradise or something like that. Uh, I've got some links that can point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And I guess the last thing is um, they we would like to see the picture of the camouflage bug again if you if you can share that with us. Let's see what I can do here. Give me just one second. All right. Share that. All right. It is, yes. And it's one of those where once I really started looking for them, uh, I actually was surprised with how often I found them, especially if a flower was looking a little ragged. They are mm -hmm. really, really well blended in. Like if you look at them from up top, it just looks like a little bit of, you know, debris on top of a flower. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you really have to kind of get down there and see them from the side. And just appreciate this fleabane flower is probably about a half inch across. So, you know, this is a small caterpillar and they move in a really fascinating herky-jerky sort of way. So um, even the way that they move is actually designed to look like just a little bit of debris flapping in the wind. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really odd because, you know, there will be no breeze. And here's this thing that kind of looks like it's, it's flapping around as if there was a breeze. And then it'll take a step forward and plant its you know, feet. Um, but yeah. I've seen them in all different colors, wearing tropical salvia flowers. I've seen them wearing gallardia flowers. That is uh, really neat. <laughs> yeah. See, yeah. this is why I love to have these guests as I learn. I learn something every day. So thank you yeah. very much, Frank. Um, and um, as always, um, both of our presentations are gonna be available via PDF. And I will show you um, at the end of my presentation, my email address that you can email me and say, please send me those PDFs so that you have a lot of this in writing and you have the links and, um, um, you know, so you can follow it, but email me because if you ask in the chat, I may not see the chat again <laughs> and you may not get answered. Like I said, my, my email kind of follows me around, so I'll be able to respond a little bit better but thank you very much frank that was fascinating yeah, um absolutely and um, just so you know we have been joined in our audience here by karen mojica from hernando county mosquito control she's just kind of hanging out there she is hiding in the grass there she is. Hey, um, um so if you have questions about mosquitoes or you need feel that you need service or something like that, um, Karen will put her phone number and her email in the chat. And, you know, we'll see if we can address those or you can um, address her directly. Um, but I do need to get started <laughs> on my program. So here are your jobs. Frank, you monitor the chat. <laughs> Karen, please monitor the waiting room if you don't <laughs> mind. I appreciate that. Let me see if I can share mine. Okay. Okay. Can you see mine? Uh, Frank, can you see my PowerPoint? I do, I do. Okay, great. Because my screen is kind of acting odd today so I have everything trying to show up on one screen so I've lost vision of you I can only see my PowerPoint now so but let's get started because um so we can be time sensitive here I just put together a few plants where if you are overwhelmed you're starting with the bank blank slate or you're starting with a you know yard full of plants but you don't feel that they're the right plants start small you know, take one step at a time. That's what I always say. Just don't become overwhelmed. Take it one step at a time. So I put together kind of a pollinator plant starter kit. 
and they're easy to find. That's always an issue as well. Now, some of these, especially the natives, you may not be finding them in your big box store. But if you, I have um, links at the end um, where you can find out where your native nurseries are near you, or even like the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery, Pasco, I know they have plant sales from time to time, they're master gardeners. They usually have these plants that I'm going to mention as well. So they're not that hard to find. And here's our salvias. Now the salvia coccinia is the native salvia. There are, um, or sages, there are non-native uh, varieties as well. Um, to my knowledge, there's no um, invasive non-natives. They're all Florida friendly. There's a beautiful black, well, the flowers are purple and the calyxes are black. Um, I call them black and blue salvia. <laughs> That's just my name for them. Um, that, you know, look beautiful, but we also, the native varieties come. Um, we think of scarlet a sage as your main native uh, plant. That's kind of what I showed there in the front slide, but they also come in pink or white and various butterflies um, love them. And they are, especially at native plant sales or master gardener plant sales, they're pretty easy to find. So you're gonna find some salvia and you wanna plant those in mass. All of these, if you can plant several together, not only does that help your design aspect, it helps the uh, pollinators find your plants. And this one I was considering not even putting in my uh, starter kit, but then I remembered, you know, this, this photo that I took with my cell phone <laughs> and just the pollinators that the beach sunflower um, you know, attracts. And this blooms pretty much all year. It can freeze, but I have areas of it where it did not freeze even this past winter, kind of under the eve of my garage. This likes the crummiest soil that you have. Hence the name, you know, beach sunflower. In fact, I, I always tell people I had a bunch in front of my house for many years, for a good decade, and it's just starting to not really be happy there. And I think because of a decade of mulching and various things I've done, I've made the soil too rich for it. It wants to grow in other places um, in my yard. So does not transplant very well. I've had very limited success transplanting it around my yard, but if you can get it, I'm sure I got it at the uh, Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery, whether or not they still have it, I'm not sure. Um, but any native nursery, this is probably gonna be a staple there. The yellow flowers are all over it. It gets to be about a foot tall. Um, and these yellow flowers will be about the size of a 50 cent piece. It's also called dune sunflower. Um, Frank mentioned firebush. Here's my 3D photo I kind of took of this butterfly. If you take it back, you can see the butterfly. Uh, they love this native firebush. And I did um, say native, so this one is one you have to be careful with and make sure you get the Hamelia patens, which is the native variety. And it's gonna be a shrub sized bush. Can freeze back, it can freeze back in Hernando and parts of Pasco, but um, not by the roots. So it's always gonna come back and it grows pretty quickly. Hummingbirds of course love this. But you want to be sure in this instance to get the native Hamelia patens, because I have heard from uh, many people that the non-native firebush, even though it looks extremely similar, the pollinators do know the difference. I guess it's been hybridized to a point where they don't really recognize it as, you know, the nutrient rich plant that they need. So you want to stay in this instance, you want to be sure you get the native variety. Speaking of which, speaking of natives and where it's important, um, Frank also brought up the whole monarch um, uh, movement, if we want to call it that. And um, I think in our desire to help the situation where the monarchs you know, we, we don't have as many monarchs as we used to. 
And so people got very exuberant in wanting to save the monarchs. And, and what often happens is when we step in to nature, thinking we want to help, sometimes we do the opposite of helping. So, you know, those uh, he mentioned, you know, it's okay once in a while to like as an experiment for your kids or something to, you know, rear a monarch in an indoor situation. <clears throat> but a lot of, a lot of uh, things happen, maybe, you know, you're doing it at a time of year when you shouldn't be and you set it free and it's winter and there's nothing for it to go out and nectar on. Or they're, they're also finding, and I just read an article this week, that those who are reared in captivity are not oriented the correct way. They, they lose their orientation to know to fly south as they would naturally have by growing up out in the wild. And as Frank also mentioned, well, we'll we may be afraid that they're going to get eaten out there. Yeah, they might. That's part of the circle of life. And we always want to interrupt that circle. So the best thing we can do is provide the proper plants to let all of life, you know, occur out there. One of the main important things of all caterpillars are to be food for the birds. So, you know, the baby birds. So maybe it's not every caterpillar's destiny to become a beautiful monarch and grow on and grow more eggs. Maybe it's their destiny to feed a baby bird. And, you know, we shouldn't really always be interfering with that. Having said that, there are, it is best to use native milkweed because the Asclepius tuberosa that you're gonna find in any big box store seems to be causing more issues than solving <laughs> any issues. And that's a long story. So I'm just gonna tell you, there are 21 native milkweed in Florida, three commercially available. And by that, I mean, at a uh, native plant supplier three that have become, um, you know, that, you're that they are able to propagate and make available to you. Although two more, more almost every single day, uh, you know, recently I actually spotted world milkweed, W-H-O-R-L-E-D, <laughs> um, being sold at uh, one of the local nurseries right around uh, the border of Pasco and Hillsborough. That's um, fantastic. And I, I have been noticing that too. Yeah, world milkweed is showing up, I think, even in the um, Florida Wildflower Foundation, which I'm going to give you that link. Yeah, <laughs> I think they have more, seeds for it. A little more adaptable than uh, some of the ones like Incarnata and Perennis that are more wetland plants. So, right. Incarnata uh, and Perennis, you have to have a wet area. They are swamp milkweeds. Um, I, I, world I say, mm -hmm. uh, you reminded me of one factor that I didn't talk about in the design thing with the need for the wetness of those two milkweeds almost everybody in Florida runs air conditioning for a decent portion of the year and that soggy spot right by the air conditioner drip is That's a, a great, great spot for sticking some uh wetland milkweed you That's know, a great idea yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but the tuberosa if you have dry areas is a fantastic option um, and he mentioned the world is out there. It, you know, it's not going to be pretty one world milkweed out there by itself. <laughs> it is not as uh, ostentatious as this <laughs> tuberosa, this orange one, but certainly mix it in and the monarchs think they're beautiful. So and that's what's the important part. Here is a, you know, classic. We know this from up north. Um, in fact, I just, um, when I was working on this, Frank, I emailed um, your colleague, Jim Mall, and I said, because it just dawned on me, I said, did rude Becky give Susan a black eye? Is that what happened with, <laughs> with this name here? <laughs> the rude Becky Herta is our black eye Susans. Um, easily found from seeds just about anywhere. This is a time of year when if you go to North Florida, you're going to find them all over the roadsides. They're just gorgeous and a great easy plant to have. Here's one of Frank's favorites. 
yeah. This, this is climbing aster. And the difference between this and many of the others is this is a fall and winter bloomer. And Frank also swears it smells like sugar cookies. <laughs> so he associates it with the holidays. Yeah, this, I actually yeah. just got in there this past weekend and was pruning it back because it's starting to flush out with its vigorous new spring growth. Yes, and yes. So pruning out some okay. of the old stuff. I found one lone flower still going on there. I don't know what, oh, wow. what was up with that branch, but it was just like, you know, March, why not? I'll pop out a flower. <laughs> but this is one where in the fall, it will be covered, covered with pollinators of all different oh, yeah. sorts. So this one is, you know, a standard as well. And you're gonna, because it is Florida state wildflower, Coryopsis, different variety, it's different species, sorry, of Coryopsis or tick seed. Don't let the name throw you. It's not going to attract ticks <laughs> if you walk through it. Um, just a happy little yellow flower and very um, in native plant nurseries are almost sure to have it somewhere. And you can also get seeds for it from the Florida Wildflower Foundation and probably other places. Just make sure though, if you're like looking for seeds on Amazon or something like that, you wanna make sure it's Florida seeds. Um, you know, the, the genotype that is meant to grow in Florida. You just wanna be careful with that. So now I, um, in our 10 plants for our starter pack, I've decided to throw in three non-natives. Um, we love natives, natives are wonderful, but uh, in Florida friendly, these well-behaved non-natives also do a great job um, attracting pollinators for us. And here is your classic butterfly garden. You should be able to walk into any big box store and find some pentas. When you're walking in the big box store though, you wanna make sure that they're not using pesticides on these plants because that's the last thing is you want to do is bring into your garden a plant that has systemic pesticides built in or has been sprayed because that's going to be disastrous for the pollinators that you already have there. So, you know, just watch out for that. And pentas come in so many different colors and um, should be all kind of the, those looking for those pretty butterflies. <laughs> These pentas should bring them to you. Okay. Here's another non-native that um, is a good pollinator uh, attractor. Hummingbirds love it as well as butterflies. This bottle brush, um, you want to be careful though with the bottle brush because, um, and get these two versions here. Citrinus, I guess they would call it, and Rigidus. Um, you can find these in the garden center, but the other types, if you don't get one of those two types, are uh, leaning towards being um, an invasive plant. So that's why you wanna be careful with the, the with type that you get. But this just is gonna have these outrageous flush of red bottle brush looking flats, exactly what they look like. They look like bottle brush um, looking flowers. And um, um, it'll be like a small tree for you and really stand out in your yard. And here's another non-native um, called fire spike. Um, I believe sometimes there's some confusion between fire spike and fire bush. I'm you know, not sure why other than the common names. So that's why I have added the Latin names here. So you know what you're looking for. Um, I brought, somebody wanted me to get them some fire bush because they knew I was going to a native plant nursery or I'm sorry, to a conference. And when I brought it to them, they thought, well, this isn't what I thought a fire bush was. And I think they were thinking of this fire spike. Um, you know, I did a post about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, that was um, sort of a Tuesday trivia, I think, about how well do you know your fire plants, seeing if you can mm -hmm. tell apart fire bush and fire spike and firecracker. Because no. I hear the names go all sorts of crazy all the time. 
that that's a good yeah you, if you have that you can i'll put it on my facebook to share uh but yeah. this fire spike has bigger leaves than um a lot of your fire bush and it is less bushy it is more like tall herbaceous plants basically and they will freeze here i had them um when i lived in actually the city of brooksville and I had a very small backyard that was very shady. And um, I got them pretty much dead from someone who gave them to me. You know, they were dying in a nursery. And I planted them and they thrived just fine in that shady area. They would freeze and they would come back. And the hummingbirds were back there um, all the time, you know, on this fire spike. So it's a, it's, and it's a good, easy, these are one of these plants you could break a piece off stick in the ground and have it grow for you. That's not gonna happen with your fire bush, <laughs> so. Right. So Lily, and, I just remembered, mm -hmm. I forgot to put plant selection guides into the link selection that I had on my presentation. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and pop four plant selection guides into the chat box right now. Great, um, thank you. FFL plant selection, Native Plant Society, and a couple different ones. So Great. Um, if anybody's interested, click on those links, open them up in another browser, and then uh, we can send them out if you email us. Uh, but that way you got them. All right. And um, those are, that was the starter pack. So you don't feel overwhelmed that you'll just, I'll just get these 10. You know, I'll spend all summer long making sure I get these 10. It doesn't have to be these 10. I'm just helping you break things down and I'll, in another slide, I'm gonna show you um, other options. But, and Austin helped us bring this up. We have, we have wildflowers that, you know, get the uh, unkind name of weeds out there already helping us out. So if you have these, like this liar leaf sage, I know you have it. <laughs> it's it's blooming all over the place right now. You can go to any roadside and see it. It's a great pollinator and people, you know, they get an attitude towards what we consider weeds. Um, this one, uh, Frank and I talk about it all the time. It's very aggressive, very aggressive. And it's gonna put those little hitchhikers over you or your dog if you're walking through it. And um, like he mentioned, yeah, it is all over my neighborhood and it puts itself in my yard. And I try to control it, but I have not had the heart to completely pull it out of my plant beds. And the reason is when I go out there, it is covered in every pollinator you could dream of. You know, it's just always, <laughs> covered and it's a photographer's dream for one thing, um, but also just don't have the heart to take that away from them. And even when it all froze back in the winter, I cleaned a lot of it up and had to leave another spot of it looking dead and icky because when I was trying to pull it up, a rabbit hopped out of it and I realized, oh gosh, she's got a nest in here. <laughs> And so I had to leave it all frozen and icky looking to protect the baby bunnies. So this, this uh, Biden's Alba, the Spanish needle, um, it's, it's kind of a love-hate relationship <laughs> with it. Here's another uh, quote. I don't know how anybody could call this a weed. It's so intricate, but it grows by itself. So I think humans have this built-in uh, thing in our mind that if we didn't plant it there, it must be a weed and it must, must not be any good. Like nature doesn't know what, what it's doing, <laughs> you know. The spotted bee bomb, you'll see it in the summer through the fall. Um, it's kind of a sad thing for me to talk about because more and more of it in my neighborhood is getting cleared away to build houses where I know that the spotted bee bomb, you know, thrives. So I've been trying to collect some seeds and things for it, but this is a fantastic little native plant. Also called, um, <laughs> what's its name, Frank? <laughs> uh, dotted horse mint. And, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, a couple different names. I was but like, yeah. something to do with a horse, yes. <laughs> yeah. Go. And this one, this I took this picture in my yard, this Florida paintbrush. There's a 
The entire back section of my yard, I leave pretty much natural. So what grows there is what grows there and the pollinators are very happy. And when you get things like this, it's Florida paintbrush. Now, some of these weeds, quote, quote, weeds, and my definition um, is a weed is a matter of opinion, um, you know, are absolutely gorgeous, but they're not, you can't really tame them to put them in a, your civilized flower bed where you want them to grow. Some you can, but some you can't. And that's why I'm saying, let these weeds, just let it be, let them grow. Here's one similar, and these were blooming recently, this blazing star, also called Liatris, could be calling it. It's also um, gay feather, something like that. Most people refer to it now as Liatris, just uh, long spikes of purple growing wild, let them be, E-E-E, -E -E. <laughs> This guy gets a poor, bad reputation. People insist that um, goldenrod gives you allergies. There's so many things out there right now giving us allergies and <laughs> goldenrod is not it. It is uh, pollinated by insects, not by wind. It hangs out in a bad crowd and therefore gets uh, guilty by association. It might hang out with ragweed, but it's not the goldenrod that is causing allergy issues. This one is blown up quite a bit, but this is one of my favorites. It has about 60 names, I think. <laughs> so we're gonna call it the easy name, the frog fruit. Um, also match edweed, it's another name. Turkey tangle frog fruit, turkey tangle fog fruit. <laughs> it's got all kind of fun names. It's a weed in your lawn, most likely. I let it be in my lawn because it attracts three different types of really small butterflies. They on crescents, um, buckeyes, and white peacock. That to me is so much better than a sterile turf and it put itself there. So this I kind of put in the weed selection because sometimes it grows like a weed, <laughs> at least up here where I live in the Royal Highlands, but it's a beautiful, beautiful bush. This is what your American beauty berries will be looking like soon. If you go out and see them, they're starting to leaf out. And so and in a month or so, they'll have these pretty flowers, maybe even pink flowers on it. And then it will turn into those beautiful dark purple um, berries. And these, they grow like weeds in my black back natural area. And I often pull them up because you can't and replant them in the more quote, quote, civilized <laughs> landscaped area because it makes a very attractive uh, landscape plant. This one, I was telling um, Frank about it before we started this morning. Um, this, this story behind this is I found these yesterday, this blue-eyed grass. And I always say the name annoys me because this, it's not a grass, it's an orchid and it does not have blue eyes, it has yellow eyes. Beside that, it's the cutest little blue flowers, one of the blue flowers of spring. And they're just adorable. And where I took this picture, the camera didn't really get how blue they are. Um, I was walking around looking for different wildflowers or weeds that are showing up now. And what's funny is I found these in the neighbor's yard and he's one who tries to fight weeds. Well, he put down some annual ryegrass as you can see there. And so I was looking at him and I'm like, Gary, did you put down ryegrass? And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, you've got some seeds for this blue eyed grass in here. It's absolutely beautiful. And he's like, oh yeah, there are weeds. And right now I can hear him mowing. So I, <laughs> I um, was happy to at least get this picture. And he promised me he would sh have the mower vent, you know, shoot my way. <laughs> so maybe I can get some of these in my yard. Absolutely gorgeous little native plants. And this one I missed with the coloring a little bit too, but I found this in the woods um, right near my house. <clears throat> this sky blue blue pine. I have some actually in my yard that's gonna start blooming any second now. Well, really hard, 
really, really, really hard to transplant. It grows where it wants to. But the amazing thing about this is this, another blue flower of spring, pops up in the sandiest, driest areas and just, you know, looks amazing with those blue spikes and attracts a lot of pollinators. I showed them specifically to my husband, the ones popping up in the yard and told him these are not to be mowed down. <laughs> Here's some other ideas for your starter kit. Um, if you wanna mix and match or just get some good ideas of what's gonna bring in um, uh, some of the different, whoops, some of the different plants here. If you will notice, I thought I had at the top, it might be, I might have it covered up <clears throat> with my screen, um, blanket flower. And actually Frank showed a picture of the blanket flower, but I don't have it um, noted as a native Florida plant. Frank, you wanna, you wanna get into that and explain what's going on there? The controversy? Yeah, so blanket flowers, Gallardia, um, Gallardia Petrella, recently got a thorough assessment by some of the leading botanists that do systemic botany and basically look at, you know, the genetic dispersal of plants and all sorts of different things. And something that's been talked about and debated for a long time is the fact that blanket flower didn't really show up in any of the early botanical records from those early botanists that were wandering around places like Florida and the Southeast Coast. Um, it was a much later arrival, the first time that somebody actually wrote it down and documented it. And so for a long time, people have kind of speculated that maybe it wasn't actually native here, but there was a little bit of confusion with a closely related cousin and the names crisscrossing at various points. And so people kind of gave it the benefit of the doubt. At this point, it's kind of been settled. And so blanket flower has kind of been given the Pluto treatment. Yes, it's, just gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, it's no longer considered a true Florida native. So it's kind of been demoted uh, to more of a Florida friendly plant. It still grows excellently well in certain, uh, especially dry habitats around here. It's great for attracting pollinators still. None of that's really changed. Nobody's deemed it invasive yet. Uh, or anything like that. Still native to the US, just mm -hmm. not considered a Florida native anymore. So if or you are flower. completely dedicated to strictly Florida natives, uh, Gallardia is, is no longer, uh, at least Gallardia pulchella, blanket flower, is no longer considered native. It's, but please don't go pull it out of your yard if you have it. Yeah, there's no reason to uh, to take any drastic measures unless you're just really wanting to be a purist with it. Um, and then, it you know, bring it to relatives. someone who will take it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and uh, it does have some close native relatives that still maintain their native status. So if you really want to kind of go that direction, you can check out uh, Astavellis, I think is the, I'm probably completely screwing that name up because I'm mm -hmm. still trying to get myself familiar with it. But um, yeah. And here are some resources if you're looking, um, where can I find these flowers? Because um, not all of them are gonna be found, or these plants, I should say, um, in you know, your regular plant center, you know, easy to be found. But if you get in touch with people who offer native plants, I try to show you know, ones that they, they're gonna have. So some of these re resources are the Florida Native, um, the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. And if you get that, you'll get a catalog of native nurseries in the state. So you can find one near you. Some of them, or a lot of them, are small hobby nurseries. So you're going to want to call and set up an appointment, well, especially during COVID and all of that. And their uh, website is at the top here. And I didn't switch those letters around. There must be something else that is F-A-N-N. -N. So their website is A-F-N-N. -N. I think um, it's a, the original name was Association of Florida Native Nurseries. And right, they switched right. the name, but the website stayed. Right, right. Um, or you can just Google Florida Association of Native Nurseries. It'll come up. Um, Florida Wildflower Foundation and Florida Wildflower Cooperative work hand in hand. Um, so 
the bottom link, the www.floridawildflowers.com is where you're gonna find a lot of seeds. Not all 100% native, but you can pick and choose and get native or you can choose um, you know, some nice non-natives like the poor blanket flower. Or um, behind me on my screen, I have the, the phlox, the P-H-L-O-X that are growing all along the roadsides now. They have for years and years and years and years, part of the uh, Lady Bird Johnson wildflower program that those seeds um, got put there. And that's another story that I um, have about yesterday and talking to my neighbor. He thought the flocks were invasive, were an invasive species because in Michigan, there's some kind of purple plant, you know, flowers that, that are. So it just got me thinking, you know, there's so many people out there um, who do get mixed up and, you know, they, they want to grow some of these invasive species, yet they're calling non-invasive species invasive. <laughs> so we still have a lot of education to do. Most of those flocks that you see are probably not native. They are um, the Dramundi, which are Texas cousins of our native flocks. There may be some native Florida natives mixed in there. Generally, those whole carpeted ones you see are actually from Texas. Still beautiful, still pollinators, still doing a great job out there. And you want to check with your Florida Native Plant Society. Hernando County has a chapter. Pasco County has a chapter. Those people um, can really help guide you, um, you know, with the proper plants. And here I included uh, Frank's blog on that pollinator's paradise. Um, help you create a pollinator's paradise. And also then if you, once you're on his blog, you can read all kind of cool things as and well. If you scroll way down there, that's actually got pretty much all the links uh, for the most part that I included today. So uh, you should be pretty set. Um, and I know we're going over time. <laughs> so here is a list of my upcoming classes. And let's see, have you been keeping up with the chat? Yeah. Frank? Okay, yeah. you can um, answer. Wow. Uh, well, it looks like um, Kat volunteered that the FANN.org actually works as well as, as a website for oh, Florida okay. Association of Native Nurseries. Right. Um, I threw in um, another blog post specifically about Monarda punctata, the, uh, the bee bomb, because okay. it's one of those where it often gets shown just as the flowers and right. not for the whole plant. And for a good part of the year while it's growing, it doesn't look like the flowers. It looks pretty wild and sort of weedy. And so right. it's one of those that um, design wise, uh, you know, I didn't necessarily cover it too much today, but try to familiarize yourself with what a plant is gonna look like throughout the year, especially if it's gonna be kind of a wildflower that blooms at a certain point in the year and is not blooming the rest of the year. You wanna know what it's gonna look like and how it's gonna play out in your garden before you get taken by surprise with something that uh, maybe shouldn't be the front all-star of your, your yeah. landscape. Right, so yes. Through that in there, um, we had a comment about tick seed that went to seed this year and uh, has seedlings popping up in Broward. They're about six inches tall now. So tick seed is one of those great ones that will, uh, over time, if it's happy, reseed itself and uh, give you more and more. You can pot some of those up and share volunteers with neighbors and friends if you want to mm -hmm. kind of get Pass them. Pass along plant. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Matt was asking a little while ago about groups of black bugs with orange spots that tend to devour as milkweed leaves. So I'm not sure if Matt's still in here, um, but my guess would be that we're talking about milkweed bugs. bugs. Yeah, um, <laughs> he didn't make that up. That is their name. <laughs> um, yeah. There are a type of bug, it, it feeds on milkweed. It's one of those handful of bugs that can detoxify the, uh, the toxins in the leaves. Um, I don't tend to go heavy handed with trying to control stuff like that. Uh, milkweed is kind of, you know, going to be devoured by one bug or another. 
And so I just kind of let it play out most of the time. If it's really wrecking what you're trying to achieve there, um, you know, you can probably go a couple different routes with trying to control them, but never seems to build up in you my You have to garden. be so careful because you don't want to put a pesticide on a butterfly plant. You totally um, destroy what you're trying to do. Right. Yeah. At most, it would probably be something where if you could selectively control, knock them into a bucket of soapy water or something like right, that, right. or just yeah. cut off the stem and figure that milkweed is going to regrow anyway. Right. Um, right. Yeah. All right. I think um, we have been able to answer everything. Here are our emails, my email and Frank's email. Okay. Um, oh, we did oh, just we have get a question, one... about, question about spinosad that one sure so it's a bacteria isn't it yes yeah, spinosad is similar to something like bt in that it's a selective uh pesticide that's basically going to only affect the insects that are consuming the leaves and it prevents them from continuing on with their feeding and their life cycle so it it's targeted but it's it's not selective specifically um, for what you would consider a bad bug versus, you know, a butterfly caterpillar that's also eating leaves. So right. if you use spinosad, for instance, to protect your vegetables and you've got pollinator plants nearby, you would want to be careful about where you're spraying because that same spinosad that's going to prevent the cabbage loopers from eating your collard greens is gonna also prevent your monarchs from eating the milkweed uh, and things like that. So it, it's considered a pesticide. It's considered an organic pesticide, just like BT, because it is derived from a naturally occurring bacteria. So that's one of those things that sometimes confuses folks is you can have something that's organic. You can have organically labeled parsley from the grocery store or uh, something like that, and it can still have a pesticide on it that can kill caterpillars. It's an organic pesticide like BT or spinosad, um, but it can, you know, it can still be just as harmful um, sure. yeah. in the same sort of way. Now, organic, I mean, nicotine is organic, you know, and very, <laughs> yeah, I mean, very toxic, you know, yeah. Let's see, it keeps being recommended to me for leaf miners, but I've not used chemicals since moving here four years and I don't want to wreck my garden. Um, you know, leaf miners have to get pretty bad before you really have to do much of anything besides um, pluck off affected leaves or squish the little leaf miner trail. Um, you know, often you can kind of take care of things in other sorts of ways. Um, I suppose. That would probably be one of those where it might be helpful to take some pictures and chat with your local extension uh, just to kind of get some input on what's going on there and uh, you know what might be the best approach. Okay. Well, we have gone, I figured we would go over because this is a topic people <laughs> really love. But um, if you have friends who have missed this, it's being recorded. It'll be on my Facebook page. Um, I'm sure Frank will share it to Pasco County's Facebook page um, this afternoon. And within a few days, it'll be on Hernando County government YouTube. So if you have friends who, you know, say, I don't like to do Facebook, most of them will do YouTube. So it's going to be on there. And YouTube is where it is closed captioned. So if you have someone who is in need of that, that's the route where to send them. It's Hernando County government YouTube. And with that, I would like to thank Frank for joining us. He always teaches me. <laughs> That's why I, I say I always bring people around who teach me things, <laughs> too. Well, thank you and, for the opportunity. It's yes. always a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Karen, for kind of hanging out there in the background. Um, you know, rec uh, find Karen um, or call Hernando County Mosquito Control if you have any issues with mosquitoes. It's getting warmer. And I know you're going to have more issues with them. So give her I a put, call. I put the phone number and the website on there as well. And okay. we're also on. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And everyone have a great week.
Indeed. Happy gardening, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>